Hello, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar with Ground Truth, Driving Demand, the Future of Auto and CTV. My name is Lizzie, and I'm a Senior Account Manager for Locology, and I will be your host for today's event. A few housekeeping items before we begin. This webinar is being recorded and will be circulated to all attendees with the presentation within 24 hours of the broadcast. Questions will be answered during the Q&A session at the end. You can, however, ask questions at any time during the broadcast by using the question window in your control panel. Our speakers today are Dimitri, Eric, and Nick. Dimitri is a strategic account executive on Ground Truth's platform team. Over the course of his 20 plus year career, Dimitri has become an expert marketer that focuses on building brands and driving growth for agency clients across a multitude of verticals in addition to his knowledge and strategic implementation of location-based media, CTV, OTT, and other digital media disciplines, Dimitri has extensive knowledge and experience in radio, TV, integrated marketing, as well as multicultural marketing. Eric is the VP of Platform Sales, who has built a strong focus in fostering long-term partnerships within the CPG vertical. Building on his background in programmatic native and publishing, he will share insights on how CPG companies are reaching their customers. And our guest, Nick, is the CEO of FlowFound, one of the top 30 rising tech companies in the Southeast, with 13 years of automotive marketing experience as an executive for Ford, a Google premier partner agency, and one of the top five dealership groups in the country. Additionally, Nick has seven years of experience as an enterprise web developer. So without further ado, I will go ahead and pass it over to Dimitri to kick things off. Hi, everybody, and good afternoon. If you're on the West Coast, I guess it's good morning. And welcome to our webinar today. We have a ton of registrants. We have a lot of people attending. We just, in advance, we want to thank each and every one of you for taking time today to be with us. We strive and promise to make this very informative. I'm going to try to make it fun as well. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope you get a lot out of it. Um, you know my name. You see my title up there. But really today, it's all about sharing insights about the automotive business. And it's about talking about the changes and the transformation over the years. But really, it's with respect to marketing and with media. Specifically, we're going to talk about CTV, but we're going to talk about all media, the entire landscape, but specifically CTV as well. And about technology. I'm going to leave the technology stuff to Nick, but I will touch on it a bit. But really, you know, what's what have been the effects of the pandemic, right? We, we just can't get away from talking about that. Uh, it's impact on really any vertical. So we're gonna talk about it today with automotive, but really it's about how does it all interrelate to the consumer buying experience and that critical path to purchase. So we went over our housekeeping items, you know, some basics. Again, I wanna stress, please send your questions over. It will go into a queue. And at the end of the discussion, I think it's about the last 10 minutes, that's what we're striving for. We will try to get to each and every question. One last item with the housekeeping, and I need to mention this, I need to apologize in advance for all of the automotive puns that have uh, been sprinkled throughout this deck. Uh, we thought it would be fun, you know, whether it's intentional or unintentional, they are there. So without further ado, here's how the day is gonna happen. This is how, this is how it's gonna go down today, right? So we're gonna talk about the changes in auto buyer shopping behaviors first and foremost. We need to put everything into context. Then we're going to get into CTV and OTT, you know, digital streaming on your television, basically. It's impact. It is one of the hottest medias right now today in the business. You cannot get out of the way of any discussion with any marketer without talking about this, but specifically the marketing efforts with respect to auto. A lot of these are going to be able, applicable to almost any vertical. So if there's folks out there working on multiple verticals, whether it's an agency or you're a consultant, they should be applicable. We will talk about solutions that drive results. These are the things that I have seen personally with my automotive clients and with my retail clients and about a lot of others, the things that really resonate, those tactics that really work and drive results. For us, that means driving people into a brick and mortar. In this case, it would be an auto dealership. A little later in this, in this uh, webinar, we're gonna have a fireside chat with Nick Sibla, he is uh, with an, he's CEO of, a, of an Atlanta-based agency. Uh, it's digital. They specialize in audio. They done they do a lot of cool things. They're very you know high tech and innovative. 
and he's going to talk a lot about the business. He's got a lot of experience in automotive with Ford and as a web developer, as you heard, but he's very, very tech savvy. And we're going to have a really cool discussion. I had a chance to preview it the other day. And again, at the end, we're going to do our, Q, our, our Q and A. So we need to put things in context because we're ground truth, right? And we need to mention exactly who we are and how this interrelates to our discussion today. We as ground truth, we are the leader in location based. And what I mean by that is visitation data, marketing uh, and ad tech company. We're about 12 years old. We are the leaders in the space. We have been, we are now. We feel we, we do things better than anybody with way more precision. And with respect to precision, we do that through a technology called Blueprints. Blueprints is like Google Maps. And the reason it's so important is because we work with about 130,000 app partners where we are acquiring uh, data, mobile location data, every nanosecond, but it's just data. We use Blueprints to give it life and to give it context. So what does that mean? You know, you, you are now uh, not just a, a, a lat long, you know, you are put into context of being at a certain place at a certain given time and over time with tendencies, right? So we use our predictive targeting products, which are ours, right? And those would be your tactics to precisely reach cross device users. At one point it was mobile users, but now we are cross device and omni channel. We do mobile, we do CTV and OTT, we do desktop. And we do that in the real world in order to influence business performance and outcomes. Oof, that was really lengthy, but at the end of the day, if you're a marketer out there, we help you become better marketers, smarter marketers with a ton of precision and with very, very little waste and with a ton of results on the back end that you can share with your bosses or with your clients to make everybody look good and to have successful campaigns. So let's talk about auto trends, right? And I love this slide because it allows us to put the automotive business into context, right? We can look at it as a, you know, how do you do things with media and all the particulars, but we're talking about cars here and cars are really an extension of who you are as an individual or as a family. It is an extension of your lifestyle. I look at this photo here and it's really clear to me that this dog, this beautiful lab or golden, I, whatever he or she may be, he was very important in the, uh, in the car buying decision for this young lady and they both look very happy. He's smiling, she's smiling, he's got his head out the window. But it, a car becomes a lifestyle for a lot of people and it stokes a lot of passions. It has for me personally over the years, I have owned countless cars and they've always reflected my lifestyle at that given moment in my life and it evokes a lot of passions. Some people are Jeep people, they wanna take the top down, put their friends in the car, go to the beach, that's part of their thing. They're environmentally conscious. You know, today's Earth Day, right? So you're conscious about that. You're going to get an electric car and you're going to hear none of it if it's about gas and you're going to get a Tesla if you can afford it. It's 150 grand, right? So, but whatever your thing is, trucks, cars that go fast, lots of horsepower, they got to be red. Whatever that is, an extension of your lifestyle. I'm not trying to fill um, the air in the room, but it's important because it all interrelates back to television and CTV. CTV is a visual medium. It's a branding mechanism but for a lot of folks and for a lot of dealers, they know for a fact that it is very important to the path to purchase to get everybody excited and to stoke their passions. Full speed ahead. Here we go with the puns, right? So there are thousands of local car dealerships. I looked it up this morning and there's somewhere between 16 to 20,000 car dealerships across the, the United States. They're new cars. Some are both new and used. Some are used. Uh, some are high performance vehicles. Whatever those things are, there are dealerships out there. there are, it's a huge footprint. They are everywhere. They are within short driving or walking distance to where you live or where you work. And they're out there and it's a very, very competitive space for customers. Over the years, we've had a lot of disruptors in the auto business. So the CarMaxes and the Cars.com came into fold, you know, 10 to 15 years ago. Cars.com, you know, their whole notion was to move everybody from the showroom online and to buy cars online. And they have been successful, but only about 10% of cars were sold that way. CarMax, take the haggle and the negotiation out of the process, right? 
make it a better experience. And they have found their niche, of course, but they were sort of the early disruptors to shape people's you know, expectations and that path to purchase. And there's been some new innovations recently along the way as well. So speaking of evolution, there's been a lot of evolution in terms of media for automotive, as well as a lot of other sectors and verticals. You know, 10 years ago, your media options, especially for auto and what they were buying was broadcast television and cable. They were buying radio, they were buying print, maybe out of home, maybe direct mail, some combination of those parts. The bulk of it, I'm guessing, was going to TV and cable. Why? Because of that strong visual medium. They needed the branding. They needed to get people excited to get into the dealerships. Sure, the owner of the dealership liked seeing his image or her image on, on the big screen, you know, slinging cars and they want to become celebrities and all that. But at the end of the day, it's all about branding for them and to bring them into the dealership and to differentiate their dealership from the one down the street. And it's always worked well. But along comes digital media, you know, 10 plus years ago now, you know, with digital solutions that involve increased transparency and accountability, both on the front end from addressability and on the back end to accountability, meaning, you know, how many people were delivered the ad, how many people clicked on, what were the secondary action requests, and in our case, how many people did we send or drive into car dealerships? Yet another pun. So off we go. So what's happened in the last 12 to 13 months and why are people buying a car? Well, a couple things have happened. Automotive was considered an, an essential and a lot of auto dealerships remained open. They remained open maybe on a skeletal staff, but they were there, right? And they were there to service people who had you know, repairs, but then also for people that needed to buy a car. And they saw people wanting to buy a car because they were just scared to take public transportation. I live in Chicago. I live in the city. I am on the trains and occasionally the buses often. And even back 15, 20, two years ago, I mean, the buses and trains weren't exactly clean. And I can't imagine what they're like now. And people are really scared of public transportation. So it's pushing them into driving more into their car. It's pushing them to get an additional vehicle for the, for the family, in their family, to make sure that everybody's safe. How that continues down the road, I'm not exactly sure, but there is a need right now for cars. And we've had a couple of good months now, especially of car sales. So let's talk about supply and demand. So when the pandemic hit, all of a sudden, the manufacturers weren't able to produce cars because plants were shut down. Plants begin to slowly open. So what we're seeing in the car business now is that it is short on supply. On the flip side of that, there's high demand. So any of us that have ever taken uh, an economics class in college or have studied economics, you know, the, the bar graph with the two lines, you know that when there is, you know, when supply is down and demand is up, you know, not only is it gonna push a lot of people to the floor, but it's gonna result in increased prices, right? So we started seeing that. I mean, I remember back in the day, you know, when I was buying, I bought my first really expensive car and I went into the car dealership. And there, at the time, there was just a lot of demand for cars. And I walked in and I looked at the car and I looked at that sticker on the car and I'm like, wow, it's, it's 38 grand or whatever it was. And I asked, I asked the salesperson, I'm like, can you lower the price of that car? And he says, yeah, sure, I can. And he went and grabbed the keys to the car. He turned the key on and he, and he put the window down with a sticker and, and he laughed. So kind of a funny story, but it just illustrates the fact that in times of supply and demand issues, it, it pushes the prices of cars up. What we're seeing is that used car prices are even up, you know, uh, right now, you know, supply is down. They are getting premium at the auction, you know, for the cost of the car and they are selling it at a premium and cars are moving off a lot at a pretty rapid pace. And I mean, who would have thought in this day and age that a, that a used car would be an investment, right? At least in the short term. Now, don't, you know, don't, don't hold me to that, but at least in the short term, it might be. But so what, what are some other key factors here? The impact of stimulus checks, right? We had another round of stimulus checks that went out in March, in, in the back part of March, and it put money in people's pockets. And I'm pretty sure and certain that, you know, it affected the auto business in, in very positive ways. People had money to spend or money to put down on a car. Some dealers got smart and offered incentives to, you know, we're going to double down on that down payment if you bring us that stimulus check to help you get into the, that vehicle. 
We saw the effects of that, I think, in March. And I know a lot of dealerships have been very busy in the month of April and they're doing quite well. So let's look at foot traffic, right? Visitation. This is the business that we're in, right? So we are able to show along uh, many verticals foot traffic, and we can do so here with auto as well. That's one of our categories. We can look at look at it on a nationwide level. And of course, you know, back here at the early part, part of March, things were going okay, and then the pandemic hit, and there was this huge dip. And then they slowly recovered, you know, right around Memorial Day which is really the first benchmark in the summer for a lot of us. But it also, that's also a, a, a big time for auto. A lot of people start buying cars around Memorial Day, especially ones that are gonna take car trips for vacations with families and that sort. You know, Memorial Day, 4th of July, Labor Day, those are the big peak times in the summer. And in markets like Chicago, summer is a great, you know, it's a big time to buy a car, period. But we saw things level out in the auto business, right? The numbers weren't gangbuster and they weren't terrific throughout the year and they may have had a bit of a down year but all in all things flattened out and they did okay and of course there was some peaks and valleys here and there so in case you're wondering how that looked um, with regions right the midwest northeast south and west the midwest took a bit of a hit right um but there was there was some some rebounds in june and then the northeast got hit a little bit earlier you know they were down 30 percent average um, for the time period, um, and then they rebounded in the summer. And of course, we can look at this all the way up to March, and we see, you know, very similar patterns, and things seem, seem to definitely be on the upswing. So let's talk about the power of CTV and television. And things are definitely changing for today's buyers and for today's marketers. Again, before you have broadcast TV, and you had cable and there was a ton of limitations. I'll get to that in a minute. But for today's buyers, they have this cool thing called digital television. And digital television, streaming television, is really comprised of two parts and they're very interrelated. Um, it's OTT, which is the overarching, the overarching part of, um, of digital television. It is inclusive of things like iPads of your desktop. It's really any device that streams content right? Whereas CTV is the big screen in your living room. That's how it is now defined. There, it, it, it is the apps that are on your TV that you're streaming, and it's the Hulus and the Fire TVs and the Roku. It's all of those things inclusive, and that's what makes up that space. And it's able to do some really cool things, by the way. So why CTV? So, you know, the very first thing that was happening, and it, it wasn't a phenomenon of the last year, but it Going back two and three years ago, it was cord cutting. And it started out with the younger set. I mean, who really wants to pay 300 bucks a month for, for cable or for dish, unless you have to, right? And it was just a smarter, more efficient way to do it. So people started cord cutting. That phenomenon accelerated you know, in the pandemic. And we can all you know, look at articles to, to justify that. We know that as a fact. But the thing for CTV, it's about its precision. So let's talk about traditional media broadcast, TV, and radio. While it's great for branding, you know, radio is the theater of the mind, and you could do some cool things there, maybe some local activations and things like that. But with broadcast TV, you are limited. It is a shotgun approach. You are going to reach, depending on signal strength, the entire DMA. And you're gonna hit everybody at once, and you hope to capture auto intenders so there may be a dealership that's located in a part of the DMA that somebody living on the outskirts is never gonna come there. So the automotive people knew that they needed TV. They just knew that there was a lot of waste associated with it. Same holds true for radio. And the broadcasters all know this, and now they're beginning to launch their own digital products to stop that bleed. But along comes CTV, right, and it allows marketers, dealerships in this instance, to target specific audience, audience segments, not just with us, but with a lot of people. They are then able to go and find those auto intenders. They are able to, to target you know, parents with children, things like that, and then to micro-target into certain zip codes and neighborhoods that may be more apt to purchase their lines of vehicles, right? So they're able to do it in a much more smart way, with more precision, with no waste, if anybody out there has ever bought broadcast television, you know what a pain in the rear it is, right? 
you buy TV based on Nielsen estimates, and it is an estimate of everybody that's watching TV. Radio works in the same fashion. So what happens, you buy um, a sample of the audience and you buy it against a rating point. And then the day that that commercial runs, there's something that happens, right? The real rating comes out and now you have to reconcile with the buyer, the client and everybody, you know, what ran versus what bought. And now you're having to run additional commercials. It's called posting. It's a real pain. But by doing CTV, it's very clean. You understand exactly how many impressions you're getting. The only thing that's on you or on the person on the other end is to optimize and make sure that you're getting all the impressions that you know you talked about getting. So let's talk about timely connections, right? There was a 92% spike in the time spent streaming with American households from July of 19 to July of 20. Wow, that, that's pretty staggering. So what, what was happening there? Obviously a pandemic happened, people were at home, they were streaming, their content more on their big screen, right? That absolutely makes sense. But then the other thing was happening was, um, you know, Dish launched their own app, right? NBC Universal Peacock was launched and Univision now is, is launching their own app and all these different folks are starting to stream their own content into apps, into digital television with increased addressability because they know this phenomenon is happening. We talked about visual engagement a couple times already, and I cannot stress this enough. Placing video ads in environments built for video consumption, it increases engagement and overall effectiveness. So let's talk about effectiveness. So we did an internal study where we took 500 of our own brands, and we found out that by adding OTT, the OTT product to a mobile marketing plan, an existing mobile marketing plan, increases reach by 10%. That's assuming we're doing at least a three week CTD OTT campaign. I mean, why is that so? I mean, there's a lot of people that are watching streaming television and that may be it. Maybe they have mobile devices and they just don't use them that much or maybe they have flip phones, but there's enough of a unique audience out there where if you're adding the CTD product and really in a smaller time span as well, but not too large, you're gonna see a huge increase in reach. And 10% to me is very significant and it's very eye-popping and it's something you need to keep in mind. So let's talk about effective marketing, right? We have a funnel on the left, you know, the, the well-known funnel and some, some stuff on the right here, but the funnel is really about moving somebody from maybe a car enthusiast, I like cars, I love my car, to getting in market and being ready to buy a car. They're passing by the dealerships, they're browsing maybe internet sites, this and that. All of a sudden, maybe there's a need for the car, maybe you're being delivered an ad, you're gonna go in and maybe do a test drive, although I'm not sure about test drives these days. And all of a sudden, you are ready and motivated to buy. Maybe there's a great incentive package on there. And you wanna move everybody from the top of the funnel to the bottom of the funnel. CTV, for in large part, is a top of the funnel mechanism, it's branding. Definitely television is, but CTV can also be middle of the funnel and bottom of the funnel because of its addressability, right? And then you have other middle of the funnel and bottom of the funnel mechanisms that you could choose. We'll talk about those in a minute, but let's talk about the path to purchase right now. So here's a fact, right? Only 5% of Americans in this country, right, in, are in the market for auto at any given time. Um, on average, you buy a car every five years. So what does that mean to a marketer? You're constantly pummeling the community with ads and 95% of those are not going to auto intenders. They may go to branding, I'll give you that, a long-term play and you still kind of need that, but really you are wasting 95% of your buying. So let's talk about branding and immediacy. There's a need and we keep saying this to reach auto intenders across various stages of that funnel, whether they are light intenders or right right in the middle of the road or they're ready to buy right and it's all about last point eliminating waste and this is a bit harsh but stop wasting ads on broader tactics i mean i can't say that enough we're not saying to take all your money out of broadcast tv and radio but it is something to consider to start moving some of that money away and by the way if you are say uh, an agency owner you know i don't know uh, the how this audience is comprised, but if you're in charge of an agency, in charge of the bottom line, you're, you're a consultant, this may be a way for your agency to grow business if you're digital only, is to go back to that client and ask for some of that broadcast money. If you are full service, it's a little easier. You can sort of ask 
to reapportion that money. And at the end of the day, you're going to probably look smarter and they're going to get better results. So let's talk about the omni-channel approach, right? So for us, um, you know, we come to the table with CTV, OTT, with mobile, and with desktop. We feel it's very important because you are you are getting people um, at multiple stages in that funnel, right? And you, and you're giving them ad messages, uh, multiple ad messages with frequency, in order to drive people into those dealerships for physical visits. Here's what we do best at Ground Truth: we measure dealership visits if you're working on another you know business line another vertical right store visits same thing we measure store visits dealership visits post ad exposure so what do i mean by that we know that if we deliver an impression an ad to somebody's mobile device whether or not they acted upon that ad and went into a dealership it's that simple and we do that with some reporting mechanisms on the back end so let's talk about some tactics and how it, it interrelates with Ground Truth. But let me put that into context real quick. So our technology at Ground Truth ensures that you reach the right people at the right time. How do we do it? What's the secret to our sauce? Every day, every nanosecond, we are collecting mobile data, right? But it's just mobile data. It is lat longs or some other information to that, right? So we have to try to understand those GPS signals and their accuracy. We have some mechanisms within that that we verify the validity of those signals and that accuracy. Um, from there, we place it into blueprints to give it life and to give it context into the physical world so that we know, I mean, it's just a lat long, right? But we know that that person in that lat long was in a Home Depot or was in XYZ auto dealership that day. And this is how we are able to determine um, patterns and buckets, so to speak, right? And then we have some safeguards in there as well to determine, and it's really the last step, if, if someone was actually in a store, were they actually in that store or were they passing by at a high rate of speed? Perhaps if they were dwelling in that location for too long, they may be somebody that works there. They may be a salesperson. They may be sort of the accountant in the back room or the credit manager at that dealership. So we have mechanisms within our algorithm that'll kick that data out. So at the end of the day, at the end of the campaign, at the end of that report, you are getting true metrics from us. We go a third step in terms of brand safety, right? By verifying what we do in terms of our data and our visits. We work with a company called Numerator. They are in the business of purchase receipts and we test about 400,000 confirmed purchases. We do this once a year and every year, the percentage of the accuracy, our data versus their data keeps going up. Right now, we're at 96.2%, 96 which is pretty darn close to perfect. But we give you that extra step in third-party validation. So how do you work with us in terms of tactics? It's a little different with everybody else, but for us, we own the Weatherbug app. It's a great app, download it if you don't have it. We are able to do some really cool things, some really cool weather trigger programs along all verticals. I will talk about a use case here in a second for automotive. Um, but on the left side, um, we, we do things uh, by location targeting in real time. We can do proximity. Proximity is simply a radius around a building and you're gonna flood that radius area, whether it's a mile or five miles with ad messaging, whether it's CTV, OTT, mobile, whatever that might be. We do on-premise advertising. We will deliver ads to people while they're in a specific location. And then we also do residential targeting. If you are a business that has an extensive list of customers, past customers, maybe future customers, we can take that list and turn it into, that residential list and turn it into mobile IDs. One, one of the areas that I love, especially for this type of uh, sector automotive is audience targeting based on location, and then ba based on behavioral audiences. Behavioral audiences for us, and I can best put that, is we can determine whether groupings of people are gym goers, right? Whether they are, say, Costco shoppers, that would be location, but whether they're gym goers, maybe they're, um, they're you know, uh, recent parents with kids, those type of things. So the applicable use case here for automotive would be this. And this is, and I'd like leading off with this slide in terms of recommendations. Now keep in mind, this is overarching 
I don't know what the particulars are for your objectives or your KPIs, but what I see that works and what I think is very valid is targeting and we can target in market for auto. I mean, that's kind of a no brainer, right? We want to target the people that are in market right now for the last month for an automobile. They are in play. They are the most susceptible to ads and they are the ones that you can drive into car dealerships. You can also, depending if you're a luxury uh, a brand, you're, uh, you know, your Audi, or maybe, maybe you have a lot with high performance luxury vehicles. You might want to look at in market for luxury auto. There's a lot of other cool things you can do here as well. Behavioral audiences, you know, let's say, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's ripe for, um, you know, minivans, you know, so you want to target, you know, uh, millennials with, with children, you know, that sort of thing. So it depends on your objectives and your KPIs, but behavioral audiences really work well for us on the right side. And I need to mention this um, because a lot of brands, a lot of automotive brands um, target by ethnicity. I, for one, was in, involved with the launch of the Chevy Cruze years ago, and their lead um, demo for them was um, Hispanics 18 to, four, uh, 18 to 49 with uh, an emphasis on 1834. So they were targeting Latinos, right? And we can do a lot of the same things, you know, again, depending on your objectives and where your dealership is located. If it is in high density areas, and I'm talking metros here in LA, New York, Dallas, Houston, Chicago, Miami, I think that's an order or pretty close. If you're in any one of these areas and your dealership um, has an uh, audience that is Latino, we can absolutely target them. We can even target them in language. The only thing I recommend is that you have enough Spanish speakers on your floor to be able to close that transaction. That's a very important thing to mention. I also mentioned location-based audiences. You know, we can look at, and this actually works very well, you know, brand loyalists. If you're a Chevy dealership, absolutely you should target Chevy loyalists. You may also want to target Ford loyalists. I can't tell you what to do broad scope, but if you tell me that there's a synergy between those two brands and that both cars are in play for an individual, absolutely. Let's tap into all the loyalists that we can for that brand, you know, based on history and intent. Um, conquesting, another one, right? You talk to most dealers and they'll tell you, oh yeah, Here's the five dealerships that we're just slugging it out every day for business. They steal our salespeople, this, this, and that, blah, blah, blah. Conquesting is absolutely something we can do. We simply map um, competitors' locations. We can look and see who's been going in and out of those places and what type of loyalists they have, and we can target those mobile devices or their CT device, CTV devices and OTT devices or their desktop. Another interesting thing that we added at the end, recent visitors to repair shops. I never thought of this, by the way, but I think it's pretty cool. If you have been in, in the repair shop maybe two or three times in the last few months, you're probably in the market for a new car or a used car. So pretty smart way to go about that. And I think, you know, again, depending on the types of cars that you have, it may be a valid strategy. And this is really cool, weather targeting. But what does that have to do with cars, you ask, right? I'm in Chicago, I live in Chicago. It's April, it snowed yesterday. I can guarantee you nobody sold convertibles yesterday or the day before and probably today. But if you are a dealership in Chicago and it is January, February, March, and the temperature has all of a sudden hit 65 degrees or 70 degrees, or you have a forecast for that day to be that high, all of a sudden people are thinking automobiles and convertibles. Dealers know this, they take their cars and they park them out front the convertibles because they know people will be in the mood for a convertible and they may actually be able to sell them. Conversely, and you may want to think of this too, if you have cold weather coming down the pike, right? You have high, uh, low temperatures, maybe there's a snowstorm coming, you may want to set up a trigger campaign for SUVs. And a trigger campaign, you're going to set it up and it's only going to be activated based on certain weather conditions. A really cool thing that we do with uh, with Weatherbug, we can also do that with CTV um, Omnichannel. So let's talk about retargeting, right? You know, it goes without saying, right? Cars are expensive. I don't know if you bought a car recently, right? They're 20,000, 40, 50, 75,000, 100,000, a buck and a quarter. They're really expensive. You have to finance them. So it's not easy to 
to get people motivated. I mean, I, for one, I've got a really good friend of mine. As a matter of fact, he, uh, I, have a, I have a sneaky suspicion that he pays more for his car than he does for his house. And when I ask him, you know, why do you do that? And he says, I'll simply put, he says, if I have to, I can live in my car, but I can't drive my house. So, and you kind of get the idea, right? So cars are expensive. It takes a lot of impressions, a healthy amount of impressions to get people motivated to get into those dealerships. Frequency is your friend. You need to hit people multiple times to get them motivated, to get them in. So shelter in place audience, audience segments is something really interesting that we um, started to fashion up about a year ago. And you know the question be, becomes, well, how do you target people during a pandemic that are sheltered in their homes and they're not moving around? There are some applications there for you know fast food service where you're going to drive up, or maybe you're going to Walmart and you're going to go to the drive-through lane. There were you know we have ways to target this audience segment. They would be low movement shelter-in-place people. This is becoming a little less relevant now as we come out of the pandemic. But just in case you have dealerships in a market where this is a relevant issue or any other lines of business where this is a relevant issue, this is something that we can do. Most auto dealerships, especially a year ago, when we started with this pandemic and they're still doing this, it's white glove delivery, right? You buy your car online, maybe you're on the phone with your, your favorite salesperson and you're negotiating, you close the deal, they get the porter to clean up the car, they hopefully disinfect it, I, I would assume they do, and they're gonna drive it over to your home and they're gonna drop it off with a big bow on top and everybody's happy. So there's some relevant use cases here to use shelter in place audience segments. So lastly, and this is my last slide of my discussion, we talked earlier about foot traffic with respect to automotive. We do this across all verticals. If you go to our website, we have a free, free, doesn't cost you anything, free foot traffic tracker. We can also send you a link to it. You sign in, you sign up for it. You could go in and play around with the months, the sectors, you get some cool visuals with maps that show you all kinds of cool things with respect to foot traffic. It is free of charge. Go in, check it out, have a ball. And uh, that's it for me. We next have a fireside chat with Nick Sibilla. He is CEO of FlowFound um, and a partner to Step One. He uh, knows a lot about the automotive business. He is a web developer. He's extremely tech savvy, and he will talk about a lot of the different things in the business, including technology. It'll be narrated by our own Eric Carlson. He heads up our platform team, our platform sales team here at Ground Truth. And uh, I'm going to hand over the keys. Sorry, another pun to Eric. Dimitri, thank you so much. And that was fantastic. Thank you for all that, that great information. I definitely encourage everyone to check out the COVID tracker as well, just because it's easy to customize and you can look at as granular as zip codes, um, different verticals, time periods, et cetera. So really valuable information. Nick, how are you? It's good to see you. I'm good. It's good to see you too. Great. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, would love to get started by just learning about Flowfound. Could you, if you could just tell us a little bit about about you and your company, and really what's making you unique in the space right now? Yeah, absolutely. I think the biggest thing is just there's a very unique chance that I've had to work across all three tiers: the people that make cars, the agencies that help them advertise them, and ultimately the people that sell them. So as we look at this, there's been a lot of change, especially with the pandemic. But the greatest is just that customer behavior has changed and they're in control. So what makes FlowFound different is we've built the largest library of 360 degree video where you can take a test drive straight from your mobile phone. And we've kind of partnered with you really to highlight that and show a huge impact in terms of really reaching people, the right people as they're on the go and then tracking that to the retail need of, did they buy a car or did they come to my store? That's amazing. Yeah, that's great technology and amazing timing as well as uh, as things have happened over the past year. Over the past year, there's certainly been changes in behavior when it comes to both dealers themselves and also the consumer. 
Um, would love to hear from your perspective, just what's changed with dealers in terms of how A, they deal with consumers as a whole, and then also B, just from a marketing perspective, what are you seeing that, they, that they've changed or are doing differently? It definitely depends on where you are. Uh, so today I'm coming to you from Florida, kind of the Panhandle area, and here it really hasn't changed that much. They, uh, you know, still a lot of people that aren't masked, uh, it's almost seen as like a thing that doesn't apply here. But then when I'm out west or when I'm at home in Atlanta, uh, it's taken very seriously and it's changed dramatically. What I would say is the one thing that's true across the board is that there's a lot of inventory shortage right now. So there were two things that drove people to start buying online and dealers to begin adopting to even let you buy online. Uh, the first was, of course, that concern about safety. For months, dealers couldn't even send somebody on the test drive with you. So you got the keys and then you got to leave and they kind of hope you came back with some sort of an education about the vehicle. And that was it. So that was the first stage for the majority of dealers that, that I work with at least. Uh, and then the second is people seem to be willing to pay more for convenience right now. So as, as there's just not as many cars available uh, as, as you touched on, it's kind of almost an investment for a used car right now because there's so few out there. Uh, as you look at that, at least if you're selling it, it certainly could be. Are you so, seeing that? So is that shortage across both used cars and new as well? Was that across it's both? It's especially impacted new, but one of the reasons used car prices is so high is because demand is so high, but supply is so low. So as we look, the ability to buy the right car online without having to worry about distance suddenly becomes really important. And a lot of our, especially larger groups, are beginning to deliver regionally instead of just saying, I only want people 10 miles around us. Interesting. And are you seeing too, is there a change then in how they're marketing or how they're trying to reach those consumers either close by or even with that larger radius as well? Are they using different media forms or even within that different types of creative, maybe even you know, with your technology? Or I'm just curious what you're seeing, any differences there with how they're marketing? Yeah, tremendously. When COVID hit, uh, you know, a lot of dealers closed. So that traditional media that kind of sustained them really went away. So I'd say the biggest shift we see really is the cable and television buys or even outdoor going into a much more considered watched or even measurable media like connected TV, OTT, and of course the retargeting side of things on mobile devices. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's the biggest shift is that's really scary for dealers to move away from. But since they were kind of forced to go away and they were watching people even in their own homes going and starting to stream and starting to do this and watching this video utilization just skyrocket. At the end of the day, most dealers are simple. They just wanna know if they came in the store and bought a car. And when they realize the thing that they knew that they trusted, like traditional media, like TV, is now something that could also tell them if they came into the store, that became something where suddenly they were very, very comfortable and aggressive in terms of reaching that. Interesting. And that's a great point, too, that as their lives and their behaviors change, they realize, too, that their consumers' lives are changing as well. So to adapt to that. Speaking of the consumers, what have you seen different? So as well, too, with the, just a change in um, supply and demand as well, what are you seeing differently from the consumer side? Are they, are they acting differently? Or are they looking for different types of messaging or reacting to certain things differently? Yeah, there's a few things that I found personally really interesting. Um, one is the concept of like curbside pickup really didn't exist before COVID, but now it seems to spike during the holidays, but actually remains pretty constant as something looked for a lot. The second is people have been able to find the best price and selection on a vehicle for a while now, but let's say 90% of automotive ads are still focused on best deals in town, best selection, uh, if you're on the dealership level versus the manufacturer at least. So as we look at that, that's one of the things that really surprised us is we ran a lot of kind of user testing with various ads using connected TV, using social media and using retargeting. And we found that in every market, regardless of region, people were five times more likely to click take a test drive online than were likely to click a special offer for $1.99 a month or something else like that. Uh, oh, the other thing that I think is fascinating right now is it's typically been the best call to action on a website of get price or get my deals. Mm -hmm. Right now, it is actually confirm availability or uh, unlock this vehicle, which has taken price almost out of it, which is really interesting, just showing that when the cars aren't available, that becomes the first thing in people's mind of, do you actually have it? 
Yeah, great point. Real, that, that's really interesting too about just that change in behavior. And you had mentioned too the the curbside pickup and things like that. So as we see things, you know, starting to come back in some ways, um, are there certain things or changes that have taken place that you think that people have had to adapt to, but now realize, hey, let's keep these let's keep these things in place. Like this this works well, or this is this is actually a really good way to keep doing business, even as things start to return back to where they were. Yeah, I think automotive's been really fortunate in that it can help be part of the solution to help grant people mobility, uh, kind of avoid those maybe higher risk things like public transportation, and that's created uh, really a lot of profitability and success there. So I think you had this shock to the system where they were thinking, are people ever coming back? Or do I have to do it all online? Into this extreme profitability over the past few months. So the things that you're seeing right now are gonna stay. Because I think for a lot of them, that was their reset. So I mentioned you know, the television going into connected TV, that one, I believe is here to stay. Anything that can track and be tracked is definitely here to stay. Uh, and I think that we're going to see uh, a lot of kind of the disruptive models gaining traction too, like the Carvanas and the the buying online and others that will that will really kind of dominate the space until service becomes the core of uh, of where a lot of the big groups are focused. Right. No, that makes a lot of sense. What do you anticipate the rest of 2021 looking like from a, I guess let's start just from a sales perspective or, or do you think will inventory start to return to, to levels where they were in the past or do you think 2021 is going to remain a year where that is going to be a struggle? I think it'll be another strange year, uh, especially on the new vehicle side. There are some fires as well as just the COVID related delays that are gonna push new cars out probably three to four months. Uh, at some point, the supply will reset. It'll be at the right levels. And at that point, I think things will go mostly back to normal. But I, I do believe that more and more will be about convenience. So you know, if you need a service, perhaps they pick up and deliver it back to you. If you buy a car, perhaps that's more of a concierge experience where you can pick it up curbside or they're gonna to come to you and you can do the majority online. I think those things are here to stay in 2021 and we'll maybe gain adoption over the next few years. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, great. Other thoughts that, that you've seen or any other trends that you've seen just from your perspective, either from the, the, the larger manufacturer side or even down to the individual dealer? Yeah, I would say that uh, it's a very interesting time to be in automotive right now, just given the pace as well as the profitability. It's uh, I liken it back to kind of 2007, 2008, when things were collapsing. It was very similar to what COVID felt like at first, but then there's a huge path of opportunity for the ones that are paying attention and keep on the numbers and others. I think you'll see a lot of the very big guys buy up groups, uh, you know, 10 to 20 stores at once, as well as then on the individual stores. Right now, it's really good. So I think you'll see a lot of the individual kind of mom and pop stores either choose to take their money and exit, Mm -hmm. or maybe even overspend to get this really cool experience. But I, I know that you're going to see a lot of innovation and willingness to experiment right now, too, with these kind of new channels of media. Interesting. So the mom and so that's interesting, too, that the, the, the mom and pop side is actually doing quite well these days. Most dealerships are right now. If they have yeah. vehicles, they're, they're selling them and they're selling them at a, a, a good margin. It's, it's probably a, a it's a good time to know somebody to buy a car from, especially if you're buying used right now. <laughs> so does has the world of competition changed a little bit for the automotive space that, you know, travel, travel has like, it's picking up some in terms of air travel, but commuting and things like that have changed a lot. So what they're competing with, has that changed, has changed at all? Or the competitive landscape been a little, been a little bit different now that they're facing? I, yeah, I would just say that the demand for a new vehicle or, or a new used vehicle is very, very high, but the available cars that are there just isn't anymore. Right. So it's it's this kind of weird space that have been supply chain uh, delays that have kind of driven this. But I think that for those that have figured out how to do it or saw it coming, they're very well positioned and you'll see those companies just explode in terms of growth. Great. Well, this is fantastic. Thank you so much and really appreciate your insights as well. And especially coming from all different angles of the business. So it's really, really beneficial to, to hear from you and to hear, hear your insights and your thoughts too about just both the consumer and the dealer side as well. Thank you.
Yeah, great. So I think we have a few minutes to open it up for questions, if there were any questions that people had, either for Dimitri um, or for Nick. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, I, we did get quite a few questions, so if we don't get to your question today, just know that we will follow up post-webinar, um, but I'll go ahead and um, start with them as we received them. So the first one I have is, on the, foot tra on the foot traffic tracker, how high can the index number go and what is a good index number that you'd want to see from an industry's foot traffic? I think part of it is in terms of the index itself, I mean, at the end of the day, it becomes more comparative. So you want to see how things have been tracking over, say, like going back to even March. I think we go back to actually December of 2019 as a starting point to then be able to compare and contrast. So I think it's more about the comparisons and understanding how each individual vertical is tracking in comparison to where it had been in the past. I think that's where more of the learnings come in and also when you can break it out regionally as well to understand see those compare see those differences i think that's that's more the value is to see where over the period of a certain window of time within a certain geography by a certain vertical um what that pattern looks like okay great um the next one i have is do you have any data on why the three-week runtime is best practice I mean, that's something that we did internally and we just felt that you know we just started to see the result happen after three weeks i mean it makes sense right because you're impressing people over you know it's not too short and not too long where that bell curve starts to go down hope that answered your question perfect um the next one i have is for the ott portion of a campaign are we targeting the same users that we are targeting on mobile or is it potentially a different household? So it's the same audience that you would be targeting. So we, again, we derive our audiences based on visitation data, right? So that is a common audience and, a, and an audience segment that powers, you know, everything. And from there, you can select it to be on mobile or you can select it to be on CTV, OTT or desktop. There are ways too that you'll be able to increase that audience. We have, we've done research backtracking visits to understand where people could have been reached to visited locations. And there are some people that are only exposed to CTV and some people that are exposed to mobile and CTV simultaneously. So there, and CTV OTT. So you can actually grow your, the size of the audience that you have the potential to reach by using both. I would add to that too, just from the kind of unique lens or the specific lens that I look at, working with dealers, working with automotive, oftentimes it's very competitive. So sitting with them and scoping out the major employer, scoping out the major competitors, winds up being a really good point to your audience expansion kind of concept there. So I think from their perspective, it's more of like a conquest. I've got to beat this person or this person is stealing my lunch it becomes almost irrelevant at that point. It's an important point, but to them, it's just not, you know, it's, I want all of it all the time. It, it sounds personal, Nick. <laughs> you, but, right. uh, I think yeah. for a lot of them it is. <laughs> all right, great, we'll do one more. Um, would you recommend different strategies for auto brands versus auto dealerships? So auto brands versus dealerships. So yeah, and if I decipher that question correctly, it sounds like you're asking a differentiation between tier three and tier two and tier one. So the explanation there is tier three are your dealerships, right? Tier two would be the region. It would be, I'm in Chicago. It's the Chicagoland Chevy Dealers Association. In large part, they are promoting models, right? They promote the brand Chevy, but they're gonna promote the model, especially with launches and things like that. And then the tier one level is just pure branding for the brand occasionally models too. So going about it is a little different. So maybe the emphasis in the middle at the tier two level may be more behavioral segments, but it has to match the brand, the brand brief of that car. So for example, if you are launching a car and the brand brief says, well, we are targeting, you know, very young people that are, you know, recent parents because it's a minivan, right? Something like that. 
you may want to select as your lead an audience segment that targets that segment rather than necessarily uh, with Dodge Caravan, rather than Dodge Loyalists or things like that. So it's just maybe reprioritizing your tactics. You should always go after intenders, but it's just shuffling the priority around a little bit. And then I think too, when it gets to the individual dealerships, you you use the granularity that that we have available, meaning you go after and you target and you geofence individual competitors, individual lots, things like that. So when you get to that more local level, that's when you use an, that additional strategy of becoming even more granular with knowing the specific dealerships, for example, or competitors that you're targeting as well. Actually, I'll make one last point to that too. If you're the Chicago Land Dealers Association, you're not going to have one point of interest, one POI in terms of visits, you're going to have every Chevy dealership in the, in the region, right? That's going to be your metric of dealership visits. So you've got to adjust that as well. We can go as deep on this as you want. <laughs> we can be here all day. Well, thank you guys. Um, and thank you to Dimitri, Eric, and Nick. Um, there were great questions and discussion. And like I said, if your question wasn't answered, we will follow up post-webinar. I also wanted to thank the Ground Truth team for putting together the webinar for us today. Just a few more items from Locology before we end today's webinar. You will be able to view today's broadcast along with previous webinars on our website, locology.com. Just navigate to research and resources and drop down to webinars. Locology is excited to share that we have a virtual conference coming up on May 17th, Place Redefined with speakers from TikTok, Fiber, MasterCard, Roku, and many more. To find out more information, please go to resource.locology.com. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please be sure to visit locology.com and subscribe for updates to be the first to know about future webinars. Have a great day, everyone. Great. Thank you. Thank you.